Thanks for joining us uh, here for this panel today. Um, we're looking forward to talking about sex work, uh, tech, and surveillance. Um, so we have two panelists who will be joining us in person, uh, Kendra and Kate. Uh, I will be moderating, I'm Elissa, um, and our panelist, Angela, uh, will also be joining us here remotely. So we are going to uh, get started with some introductions. Um, and then I have a couple of questions to ask the panelists, but we're looking forward to uh, questions from all of you here attending. Um, we'll be taking questions both from uh, those who are with us live as well as from the Slack. Um, so to get started, a little introduction for myself. Uh, I'm Alyssa Redmiles. I am a faculty member uh, and research group leader at the Max Planck Institute for Software Systems. And I study safety and security for marginalized groups, including sex workers, uh, particularly folks who work in person in the European Union, as well as more recently, folks who are doing exclusively digital sex work, uh, such as OnlyFans and other forms of content creation. Uh, next up, I would like to ask Kendra uh, to introduce themselves. Uh, sure. Hi, everybody. Super thrilled to be with you here today and with this like incredible panel. Um, my name is Kendra Albert. I'm an attorney. I work at the Harvard Law School Cyber Law Clinic, where I teach law students to practice technology law by working with pro bono clients. Um, and a fair amount of my practice is freedom expression oriented, particularly with a focus on sex workers. Um, but sort of more broadly, I also serve as a legal advisor for Hacking Hustling, which is a New York based group of sex workers and accomplices working to interrupt um, violence and criminalization uh, that's facilitated by surveillance and technology. Um, and yeah, just thrilled to be here. And uh, next up, I'll ask Kate if you can please introduce yourself. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Um, I'm Kate Diodamo. I work with Reframe Health and Justice. We're a consulting collective that works at the intersection of criminal legal reform, harm reduction, and healing justice. And what that's meant for me is that my background is as a community organizer for folks that trade sex, both locally and nationally. Um, dealing uh, through predominantly harm reduction and anti-violence lenses. I've also worked with uh, service providers that serve folks that trade sex in kind of more traditional service provision ways, as well as in anti-trafficking spaces that serve folks that are trafficked uh, regardless of industry, predominantly non-traditional industries. Um, and I'm really excited to be here and have this conversation, so thank you. Thanks, Kate. Uh, and last but certainly not least, uh, Angela, if you'd please introduce yourself. Hi everyone, it's so wonderful to be on this panel and to be here with all of you today, even if virtually. Um, so yeah, my name is Angela Jones. I'm a professor of sociology at the State University of New York. Um, my current research focuses on sex work with an emphasis on online sex work and marginalized workers' labor experiences. My most recent book is entitled Camming, Money, Power, and Pleasure in the Sex Work Industry and published with New York University Press. It's the first comprehensive research monograph on the erotic webcam industry. My recent academic journals, articles focus on the labor experiences of transgender and disabled sex workers. Mm. Um, I work specifically on transmasculine and non-binary escorts focuses on how marginal identities and social locations shape online harm reduction strategies and how cissexism shapes workplaces and labor experiences more broadly. Um, my newest article on sex work and disability is forthcoming in a special issue of Disability Studies Quarterly and shows that erotic labor is far more accessible than most square or vanilla work. Um, and according to my respondents, especially trans people, sex work is often the only work available to them that accommodates their needs and lives. Uh, finally, I have a forthcoming piece on FOSTA-SESTA and its transnational harms to sex workers, which um, I sense will come up in our conversation today. <laughs> and I know all of us on this panel have much to say about its harmful effects. And I think it's critical that so many harmful policies like FOSTA regulating the internet have disastrous effects on privacy and free speech and are not limited to sex workers and should sound the alarm to anyone interested in protecting individual rights. But let me stop there because once I get all of my <laughs> I'm stop myself. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Um, yeah, so our first question for our panelists today is what is one thing about sex work that you wish a technical audience understood? Uh, and I'll let whoever feels uh, most excited about answering that first, go ahead. Um, I can hop in. Um, I think one of the things that's really, really important and uh, is really shaped by the dialogue that we have 
is that there is not a dichotomy between trafficking victims and people that trade sex. When we're talking about folks that trade sex, we are talking about every single identity, class, race, documentation status, ability, uh, physical ability status, mental uh, disability status. And that's true. We're also talking about people who face a range of experiences of, of what trading sex looks like. And so when we're talking about people that trade sex, that includes people who have a lot of options and have a lot of other choices available. That includes people that have a constrained number of choices and for whom sex work really is the best way to meet their needs, uh, to meet their resource needs based on the other circumstances of their lives. You're talking about people who are vulnerable to trafficking and are very much facing different forms of exploitation. You're talking about people currently in trafficking situations who are looking for opportunities to find support, to leave. And you're talking about people who have recently and long left their trafficking situation. So when we say that something impacts folks that trade sex, and uh, a decision impacts sex workers, we are talking about every single one of those categories. And when we talk about how people are impacted, the people with less opportunity are the people who are most impacted. So let's say there's something that happens that kicks sex workers off a platform or they lose a platform. People with a lot of other opportunities, people with a lot of other choices available, probably are gonna be okay. They're gonna be able to go somewhere else, they're gonna be able to do something else. People who have less options, including people whose trafficker does not care about the loss of that platform, about losing that account, about losing that income, does not care. And so when we're talking about impacting folks that trade sex, that includes everyone who is in proximity to or experiencing a trafficking situation. And the binary that was created is entirely an imposed one and not a natural one. Mic drop. Thank you, that was great. <laughs> <laughs> that concludes our panel, we're done. Um, Angela, do you wanna go next? No, I mean, I think you can jump in. I was thinking the same thing, like mic drop. I mean, Kate nailed it. I mean, I think if I'm going to add anything very briefly, it's just to say that I wish that folks on the tech side understood that these kind of, uh, the choices that folks are making around algorithms, the design of websites, I'm um, changing, constantly changing terms of service, all very often have incredibly deleterious effects on sex workers. Um, but, but, but Kendra, yeah, please feel free to jump in. <laughs> Yeah, I think there, I really struggled actually how to answer this question because in some ways the entire panel is an answer to this question, right? Like, what, you know, that like that's what we're trying to do. But I think that one of the things that I've learned in particular as someone who works in coalition with lots of sex workers but doesn't have a background in sex work and hasn't done sex work is that the idea that sex workers were not already present in the spaces you were in is false, right? You know, just because you don't know that folks have traded sex, that folks have um, engaged in forms of sex work, you know, or the folks experience trafficking, like, doesn't mean those folks aren't already present in the spaces that you're in, both at this conference, but also sort of more broadly in technical spaces. You know, the number of folks who I think have done some sort of sex work and then ended up not ended up in tech because often doing sex work is some of the same kinds of skills that it is required for things like computer security or like tech more broadly is really large. And so I think that when we think about, you know, just as Kate sort of was like troubling the binary, right, of like, you know, sex trafficking versus sex work, right, it's also important to remember that like, you know, it, it is not as if the sex workers or folks who trade sex are over there and we are over here. These are always going to be overlapping categories. And, you know, some of the, you know, and I see my work is doing is sort of creating space for folks who are already in these spaces to talk about either their experiences if they want to, or just to share kind of the things that they know, whether they want to identify with a particular label or not. Amazing. Thank you all. Um, Next up, I'd like to ask what the main threats are uh, to the sex workers with whom you work or from, you know, your point of view working with these uh, communities. And uh, Kate, I'll ask that you kick us off uh, here again, <laughs> since your, your answers have been so good so far. Um, yeah, I think, and, and we're going to talk about a lot of different threats. I think for me, um, as an organizer and as someone who works uh, directly with folks, the concerns I have are not about any kind of individual platform, but about the risk people take when they are kicked off of certain platforms or when they do lose access to certain spaces. And so, you know, when uh, there's kind of right now this idea that like lack of visibility means that people go away. 
and sex workers don't go away. You know, losing a platform doesn't come with like a living wage job that provides childcare. And so what happens is people make other decisions and they move around often to places and spaces that they had previously looked at and said, that doesn't work for me, I'm gonna choose something better. And so what we're talking about is, yes, some people do get, uh, get uh, kicked off a platform or lose access, and sometimes they do go into street-based work. Sometimes they do go into uh, more in-person ways, but that is um, really dependent on a lot of different circumstances. What people mostly end up doing is going to other websites and going to other platforms, and especially as more and more of these spaces pop up, it, is, it, it does become somewhat predatory sometimes, where people are constantly getting emails about like, have you tried this website? Have you tried this website? And every time these crackdowns on websites happen, or every time these crackdowns from websites happen, what happens is people move to places where it's predominantly based offshore. It is, you don't have customer service anymore. You can't call anyone. There's less opportunities if someone, uh, if you post an ad and something happens to that ad, someone steals your picture, someone steals your information, there's nowhere to go. And so you have more and more where people are giving IDs, credit card information, uh, pictures that they don't want distributed uh, without their consent, to as many different places as you go because you're still looking to make up that income. And you're dealing with people who are more conscious about taking on that risk of criminalization, that liability to host this information. And that means that it's really restraining the choices. And you're forced to make choices that compromise certain parts of safety. You're giving up the safety that you had on a website that was based in the United States, like Rent Boy, where you had a customer service department. You have to give up the safety that it offered to be able to still make your resource needs. And so your needs don't change. What happens is your risk calculation does. Thank you, absolutely. Um, Angela, I'll ask if you want to, to share next. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I want to. <laughs> um, so, I mean, as far as my research and thinking about the primary threats that sex workers face, you know, my research on the camming industry, folks talk a lot about things like discriminatory content moderation. But if the question is really about the primary or one of the primary issues, I'm gonna focus much of my comments um, on online banking. Um, discrimination um, as this ongoing threat to sex workers um, and specifically the systemic banking discrimination mm -hmm. they face and the ways that it cuts across industry sectors. Um, so let me actually just start really quick with two flashpoints. So first, I'm sure fo some folks in the audience remember in December 2020 when the major credit card companies, namely Visa and MasterCard, stopped processing payments for the tube site Pornhub. The second moment also during the pandemic, timing, not a coincidence, mind you, was when MasterCard threatened to stop processing payments for pornographic content on OnlyFans, which they then walked back due to sex worker activism. And frankly, some of the most positive news coverage of sex workers I've ever seen in the mainstream, which frankly, undoubtedly was related to misguided public perceptions of who works on OnlyFans. So picture young, white, middle-class content creators struggling to survive during the pandemic. What happened with Pornhub and OnlyFans is actually a microcosm of two much bigger issues. One, systemic banking discrimination, and, the, and two, the growing political capital of right-wing religious anti-porn and anti-sex work groups who manipulate public outcries over labor trafficking to further their end game of ending all sexual commerce. So well before the Pornhub and OnlyFans moments, Sex workers have been dealing with the effects of systemic banking and financial discrimination. While sex workers can sometimes fly under their radar, American Express, Cash App, Chase Bank, PayPal, Venmo already had policies refusing to process payments for sex workers across erotic industries, including legal ones like porn. And so I think it's important that we recognize the impact here, right? Like beyond the adverse effects on wages, as if that wasn't enough. I'd ask everyone here in the audience to think about this for a minute. Can you imagine being a self-employed entrepreneur in a capitalist economy and having your access to an entire banking system cut off, right? This has implications for housing access, credit, insurance, and so on. And this form of occupational and banking discriminations, to my mind, are civil rights issues, right? And so make no mistake, this financial discrimination is by design, not by accident. 
This is all part of the strategy of anti-porn and anti-sex work groups like the National Center on the Sexual Exploitation, formerly Morality in the Media, groups like Exodus Cry to defund. And as Kate was so eloquently talking about, deplatform sex workers, right? So these groups exploit anti-trafficking efforts to further their goal, again, this end game of ending all sexual commerce. So sex workers must fight this kind of multi-front war involving right-wing religious anti-porn groups and activists, the carceral state and harmful governmental policies and discriminatory financial and banking institutions. Stop there. Thanks, Angela. And next up, Kendra, I'm hoping that you can kind of, you know, take us further into the, the policy side and what you've seen there. In terms yeah. of threats. Um, again, I get the, the privilege of attempting to go after Angela, who again just dropped the mic. Um, so I, I guess I will sort of, Angela did a really good job of talking about sort of the financial discrimination, and I want to kind of bring us to talking about um, FOSTA, which some of you may be familiar with, but I'll just sort of back up a little bit because I think what Angela was talking about, about sort of the right wing, moral panic, anti-sex work, anti-sex stuff also shows up in kind of the lead up to FOSTA. So FOSTA is the Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act of 2018. It was combined with a bill called SESTA. It, I honestly think that like picking, it's sort of arbitrary which one you call it, right? Is it FOSTA, is it SESTA? Well, it really was the worst of both. So like whatever you want, right? Um, but basically uh, FOSTA slash SESTA did a couple different things. And one of those things has gotten a lot of attention and that's the changes to section 230. You heard us talk about section 230 yesterday. We will talk about section 230 tomorrow. If you had a bingo card, section two for this conference, section 230 would be on it. We could play a drinking game. But the point being that FOSTA slash SESTA um, eliminated immunity in a very small number of cases for conduct involving sex trafficking um, and uh, also some conduct involving promotion or facilitation of prostitution. Now, it's hard to talk about FOSTA-SESTA because there's what the law says, which I have written along with my colleague, Lorelai Lee and Elizabeth Brundage, a godforsaken 87 pages on um, in our law review article, FOSTA in Legal Context. Um, but there's what it did. And frankly, those two things have very little to do with each other. So what FOSTA says is it's a narrow set of Section 230 carve-outs and a broad federal, new federal criminal provision um, that potentially covers uh, online platforms that facilitate or promote both sex trafficking but also prostitution, aka sex work. Um, that's what FOSTA says. The industry reaction to FOSTA and the uh, policy steps that were taken to what, for what I presume is sort of at least in part compliance reasons was vastly disproportionate to the changes in 230 that actually occurred as a result of this law. And I think that this, what I like, the story I want to tell here is not just that that I think represents how uh, tech platforms to some extent have been complicit in the, the uh, sort of dynamics Angela is talking about, which is sort of overcorrecting by kicking off sex workers, even in cases where actually liability would be minimal, if at all, um, because sex workers were not are not considered a you know important stakeholder group for some organiza organizations in the tech space. I think the other backstory bit about FOSTA that I want to tell that I feel like is really important, and I think maybe I hope will resonate with this audience, is that um, in the lead up to FOSTA's passage. Uh, basically, there was this back and forth over these two different bills, one of which changed Section 230 and the other of which created a new federal criminal provision um, for online platforms engaged in promotion or facilitation of both tra trafficking and sex work. And I emphasize that not to reiterate the binary that Kate already destroyed, but because I hear a lot that people are like, oh, FOSTA is a sex trafficking law that went wrong and harmed sex workers. No. It was written to harm sex workers. It's right there in the text, and you can see it. And you can see it in the messaging of organizations like uh, Mora uh, Morality and Media, now called uh, National Center on Sexual Exploitation. But what happened during FOSTA's passage was that tech companies got behind the federal criminal provisions because they saw them as less risky to their, to their business models um, than the potential changes to Section 230. What passed was both of those things. So, you know. So much for that theory. Um, but what that effectively meant is that I, you know, in the way I think about it, many companies were making sort of a, a devil's bargain to say, hey, you know, the people who are going to be charged under these federal criminal provisions are not going to be Google or Meta or, you know, uh, Amazon, pick your pick your large 
tech company here, you know, this is going to be smaller sites that specifically cater to sex workers or specifically are, you know, uh, not don't have the resources. And that sort of dynamic where um, large entities are sort of pushing criminal risk on smaller organizations and on people um, because they view that as preferential from sort of a bottom line perspective is like one of basically what we're seeing also in the financial space to some extent, right? This form of violence um, that comes from a sort of misunderstanding of kind of what criminalization means. Um, and I've already gone on long, so I'll just like do a beat more on that, which is to say that you know, I know there's lots of folks in this room and watching online who are familiar with the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, right? So the federal anti-hacking statute. And I think the folks in this room would probably say that there's things that might be prohibited under the federal, the, under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, things that would be federal crimes um, that they don't actually find harmful and they don't really think should be illegal, right? And I, you know, in some ways, I like want people to take that same framework where they understand that behaviors that they do every day could be criminalized, um, and that you know that causes immense harm to them and causes immense risk and uh, risk, um, and apply it to sex work, where you know we've seen platforms sort of take on this like you know make it go over there, you know make it go you know platform uh, online uh, websites that uh, serve ads moving offshore, because you know. This is sort of pushing criminalization risk on somebody else. And we've seen you know, tech companies and other folks in the space in various areas take on really significant legal risk in some cases because it was worth it, right? I think about things like Google um, potentially standing up to the federal government and saying, no, you need a warrant for, the, for emails, right? Even if they're older than 180 days. And I think what we haven't seen is that kind of solidarity in reference to folks who are doing sex work or folks who are in the sex trades. And that really makes me sad because these are many of the folks in this in the do work in this space um, are some of them are experiencing profound criminalization and harm at the hands of the kinds of deplatforming that were that Angela was talking about. Thanks, Kenja. Um, I'll just add on a little bit to kind of wrap that up, right, which is coming from the, you know, the European perspective, right, all of these regulations, this deplatforming, the discrimination affects workers, including those who are, you know, legally registered to work, they're doing work, they pay taxes on, etc. Um, and so we often hear, you know, great pain and confusion, as well as significant harm, right, from not having access to digital banking, that means taking cash payments or, you know, going to some of these questionable uh, websites that Kate was mentioning. This means not being able to discuss um, harm reduction, ways of staying safe, uh, not being able to be visible as a labor force, as a group um, in the digital sphere, right? Some terms of service, say on Instagram, don't allow any conversation about commercial sex work, whether it's legal or not. Um, and so that means a whole very large group of people, uh, estimated to be like one in 200 in the world, is completely becoming invisible. Uh, and that creates a lot of pain, especially when kind of US you know, regulation or sentiments or morality is driving what happens for the rest of the world. So I want to um, ask a question to our panelists that came up in the, the Slack conversation. Um, so one of our attendees said, you know, they would love to see some data on how many VC firms have, you know, morality clauses or et cetera that apply to what they will or won't invest in. And, you know, thoughts on how that might affect startups, you know, in like the fintech space, or I'm going to say just more broadly um, in the space of sort of digital intimacy, you know, how might that kind of funding stipulations, these kind of regulations affect whether or not people will kind of dare to have sex workers as customers or users um, or even support, say, sex worker led developments? Um, Angela or Kendra, I'll let perhaps one of you guys start off. I have a lot of thoughts, but Angela, you're welcome to go if you if you want to want to start off. No, Kendra, please take All it. Right, so a, I think it's a great question, and I have no idea what the answer is, right? I would be super curious to hear more about sort of how like VC funding and both, you know, explicit rules, right? Something like a morality clause, but also implicit sort of biases around what stuff is worth funding um, sort of is shaping the space. Um, my other two thoughts there are, you know, 
in some ways, I'm a little skeptical of like trying to like push for VC funding of platforms that are going to be like sex worker centered or helpful for sex workers, because one dynamic we've seen in this space over and over again, like going back basically as far as you, <laughs> as far as the internet, um, and there's uh, our colleagues at Hacking Hustling, including um, Kate put on this amazing set of conversations called, I think it was Text, Trains, and Tits, is that right? Yes. Um, about sort of the history of kind of sex work and platforms and infrastructure, um, is that, you know, platforms will use sex work, sex work, sex workers, sex workers' labor, sex workers' expertise to kind of build up an initial user base. And then once that, like, they've got that, once they have folks on the platform, they'll begin making it harder and harder for sex workers to work on those platforms. And in some ways, what Angela was talking about with OnlyFans, like, folks very much saw that as a really good example of kind of this dynamic, right? Where it's like, ah, yes, like, OnlyFans became incredibly popular as a result of sex worker labor. Um, and then you have not, like, a variety of different folks joining the platform, and then OnlyFans under pressure is like, well, maybe we could get, get rid of the sex worker folks. That didn't go so well. Um, so that makes me a little nervous about kind of pushing on VCs in order to kind of talk about funding in this space, because you know, in the absence of real uh, meaningful accountability to community, to specifically sex, sex worker community and sex worker communities, um, you know, I feel like it's just going to be the same thing again. The other thing I will say about this is, um, you know, I work with a small number of platforms that are interested in making things suck less for the sex workers that are on them um, and through my legal practice. And there aren't a lot of people who do that. People sometimes ask me for referrals and I'm like, I honestly don't know who I would send you to. Uh, but, you know, there, it is um, very, I think, it, it is very difficult. Imagine if basically all of the infrastructure you use, all of the large platforms, you were just waiting for them to kick you off, right? So um, there's, a, there's a website called Twitter, um, which was sex worker Twitter, which is a group based out of Australia, really some really cool folks doing cool work out of Australia, where you know at least in some parts of Australia, sex work, sex work is um, asymmetrically decriminalized, which means that it's legal to sell sex, but it's not legal to buy it. That, that model sucks, and we can talk about that if we need to, but like, that means it's not illegal to do sex work. Um, when Twitter was sort of getting launched, I believe um, there, I'm actually not going to name the uh, platform because I'm not sure on the details and I don't want to call anybody out unnecessarily, but they were working with, they were trying to use basically a platform that many of you would probably use to launch a website, right, um, that, you know, allows you to scale more quickly. And that platform was basically like, we can't serve the, your website. You just can't use our platform. So it's not just that like, oh, you know, the VCs won't fund it, or even if the VCs do fund it, you're going to be under VC pressure to kick the sex workers off once it gets to critical mass. But also many of the tools that you would use to effectively build a modern, you know, website that would be sort of responsive and, you know, <laughs> good in the same ways that we expect websites to be now are just unavailable because if you specifically focus on serving sex workers, they will kick you off in part they may claim because of potential FOSTA liability. Yeah. Um, Angela, I know you've seen some kind of participatory action work from folks kind of working on building their own platforms. Don't know if you want to, you know, respond to, to some of what Kendrick said there or any examples where people are building successfully. Um, so we have seen some folks trying to build out alternative platforms, whether that's, for example, a kind of sex worker run and led alternative to OnlyFans. Um, given that the largest um, platforms for advertising full service sex work are owned by a very, very small cohort of the same affluent um, folks, um, we've seen folks creating their own platforms for advertising services. Um, which in some ways is reassuring, but in other ways, I don't think that we should wholly rely on sex workers to do all of this labor. And I guess speaking to some of what Kendra was saying, what they were saying towards the end, I think, you know, I believe in the importance of, um, as, you, as you were starting to say, of participatory action. And folks, you know, sex workers have this really famous mantra, right? Um, nothing about us without us. And so if there are folks, VCs or, or other spaces, um, that are looking to conduct any research or any actions um, that, that should involve sex workers, right? So put another way, if tech companies, for example, are interested in creating more inclusive spaces 
or addressing any of the threats discussed here today, I'd argue that developing those strategies should always be done in consultation with sex workers. Thanks, Angela, uh, much appreciated. Uh, so another question that we have coming in is, if y'all could speak a bit to some of the spillover effects here, you know, what are the similarities between um, the situations that sex workers experience and those faced by other groups, which maybe they're a part of or just, you know, similar to in certain ways? And then are there any particular, you know, ways in which this population is especially unique um, that you think folks should have in mind as they're designing and building products? Uh, Kate, I might ask you to, to start with that one. Yeah, um, and I know I don't see the, uh, the slack. So if I'm answering a different question that's being asked, totally feel free. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, when we're talking about kicking off sex workers, when we're talking about removing sex workers, that's generally not the end <laughs> of where this kind of stuff um, goes. And so there was actually a recent study, um, it was really small, that came out of the UK that looked at parental controls and what was being excluded. And almost every single one of them excluded the Trevor Project, exclude, which is for LGBTQ and especially trans youth. Um, excluded uh, really mainstream LGBTQ content, um, and, and more than half excluded information from Planned Parenthood. When we're looking at what happened after the bans on abortion access in Texas moved through and the liability expanded, what was removed off of Instagram almost immediately was information about how to access self-managed abortions. And self-managed abortions uh, are I'm not going to go into that, but it uh, is an incredibly important resource for people who now all of a sudden are 300 miles away from their nearest abortion provider. And so when we're talking about, you know, sex workers going first, sex workers being the canary in the coal mine, um, it is not the end of where it goes. It is not a coincidence that FOSTA-SESTA really talked about commercial sexual exchange. It talked about um, facilitation of prostitution and what comes out immediately after is earn it, which has a much broader conversation around sex. It has a much broader conversation around all pornography, which we I thought we had settled that like 50 years ago. We have this thing called the First Amendment. And, and that's not a coincidence. And so the spillover is really cascading down. And I think what we're talking about is ultimately respectability politics. The difference between sex work and sex workers and then reproductive justice and abortion after that and LGBTQ spaces and trans spaces in particular are who is stigmatized most, who is most excluded, then trailing down from there because sex work is not the target, sex work is the first target. And so when we're talking about these bans, they're never going to be exclusive. They're never going to be narrow. And they're not going to be the scalpel that, that people advertise them as. Um, and, and, you know, stigma is something I also really want to kind of name in this space because it makes sex work really easy to target. And that includes from, you know, tech spaces and when we're talking about morality clauses. This conversation around morality clauses and venture capitalist funding would not happen if their morality clause was, was about LGBTQ spaces. And it's because a lot of, you know, tech areas are pretty confident that they are queer friendly, that they want to be, that they want to protect that. They understand that that is, you know, an area that deserves protection, deserves space, that when queer kids are looking for basic information about their bodies and their lives and their development, that they're not gonna find that in schools. And so access to technology, access to digital spaces becomes that much more important. We know that, we've had that conversation. And in a lot of tech spaces, that is you know, a baseline. And if a venture capitalist came up and said, I will give you money, but if there's anything remotely gay on this site, it's going down. No one would ever accept that. But we do it for sex work because it's just easier, because you're going to not get a lot of the anti-sex work backlash, because in COSI and morality in the media, who does have you know, anti-LGBTQ hate groups on their board, and yet are still being talked to on the Hill, are still being interviewed by magazines and put forward as a mainstream organization because they expressly hate sex work. All of those are really comfortable. And a lot of it, I, I have to say, is because of the internalized anti-sex work bias, the, the dirtiness that 
still is really pervasive in a lot of a, a lot of technology spaces because it's an uncomfortable conversation, and uh, and and one that still has to has to happen. And the only way for us to move forward is if those conversations, if we can talk about sex workers without yes, this dichotomy of like the sex work is over there and the technology is over here, and you know yes, there's these websites, but that's not who we are. When ultimately, yeah, as Kendra was saying, like sex workers and the sex industry built a lot of technology. If you want to look at who mainstreamed um, streaming platforms, it was porn. If you want to look at the two um, internet-based subscription services that were the biggest at the very beginning, it was the Wall Street Journal and it was a stripper named Danny in Seattle. And so when we're talking about you know, who is central to this conversation and, and who needs to be included, and the reason why they're not, it is sex workers and it is stigma. Thank you, Kate. Uh, Angela, you know, I don't know from your kind of intersectional disability research if there's anything that you'd like to add here. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Kate. I think everything that Kate was saying was so spot on and especially in relationship to the importance of thinking about stigma um, as part of this broad conversation we're having. And, and I think especially, Alyssa, as you were noting, I think thinking about stigma using an intersectional frame or perspective is also incredibly important. Right, so any policy or forms of stigma or stigma <laughs> that we discuss are surely to have some universal or baseline effect on all workers, right? But race, gender, ability, class, and so on are all going to compound these effects, right? So sex workers often publicly discuss the importance of examining what they colloquially call the hierarchy, which refers to a stratification system within the sex industry, whereby, for example, full service sex work is located at the bottom, right? And labor such as camming and maybe pro-dom work is situated at the top of that hierarchy. So given that some forms of sex work are criminalized and heavily policed and others not so much, this creates a system whereby some sex workers face far more stigma and harm than others, right? And, and further, one's identity and social location shapes stigma and state persecution, right? And as Kate was talking about, so just as an example, if you look, for example, at, at New Zealand, right, their decriminalization model is often held up as like the gold standard, right? But yet when they passed the Prostitution Reform Act in 2003, it only decriminalized sex work for New Zealand citizens and holders of permanent residency and intentionally excluded migrant sex workers under Section 19 of the Act. So migrant sex workers still face deportation, threats of incarceration, so using this example, just to, just to argue um, that racism and, and xenophobia also shape the stigma that's happening. And so again, I'm just using these examples to say that, um, especially when we're thinking about interventions, um, we should not paint all sex workers with a broad brush. Yes. Alyssa, Alyssa and, can I tag in yeah. real quick? Yeah, yeah, go So I think, yeah, just to sort of add to what Angela and Kate were saying, I think the other thing that has been really helpful for me to understand, and I want to sort of really credit my colleague, Danielle Blunt, who like really I think has been thinking about and talking about this, is that, you know, these types of uh, platform and algorithmic um, sort of suppression of sex worker speech don't just affect actual sex workers. They and, also affect people who look like sex workers. And that really gets to what Angela was saying about sort of like, you know, the inter like the way uh, sort of stigma and intersectionality shapes how folks experience this. And I want to give a non-digital example um, because I think that it uh, it will help illustrate what, you know, what this might look like digitally. Um, but so folks might be familiar with the idea of like walking while trans bans. Um, so this is a form of basically uh, there are laws that um, basically either prohi prohibit uh, loitering for the purposes of prostitution. Um, so this is like, you're standing around and I think, you, I, the cop, think you might engage in some prostitution, so I'm gonna arrest you. And the reason that folks call these walking while trans bans is they are predominantly used to police, literally, the uh, women of color, trans women of color who are exist in public space, independent of the, whether those folks are engaged in sex work or not. And you know, like it shouldn't matter, but it does, right? And 
they were basically these laws, which are theoretically facially neutral, end up really having these dramatic negative impacts on the lives of trans women of color because they are presumed to be sex workers because many trans women of color are sex workers, but some you know, aren't or aren't engaged in sex work at that particular moment. And I think when we think about sort of algorithmic suppression of speech online, you know, we're seeing kind of the, some of the equivalents of what it looks like well to the walking while trans bans, where you know it doesn't matter if you're engaged in sex work or not. You know, if you look, if you're algorithmically look like a sex worker, as you know, um, as my colleague Blunt would say, you know, you can end up facing the same kinds of you know search suppression or facing the same kinds of getting kicked off platforms um, because you know. It, it's, not, it's not necessarily precisely targeted to folks who are engaging in particular forms of, work, of sex work. I think the other thing, just to build on what Angela said about the hierarchy here, is that you know, I don't talk a lot about legal versus illegal sex work in my work, um, in part because like, it is incredibly difficult to probably basically impossible for any platform to actually be able to make a call about whether certain forms of sex work are legal or illegal. And let me give you an example. In New York, um, pro, like being a dominatrix is legal. Like BDSM for pay is legal. I mean, that doesn't mean it can't be criminalized or you can't face you know, potential police crackdowns, but like the text of the law right, about what constitutes prostitution does not include um, certain kinds of domination that don't sort of result in sexual contact. That's not true in other states in the United States, right? So is, you know, being a, a pro-dom, is that legal sex work? Is it illegal sex work? Like, you know, I could tell you if you gave me a full description and a couple of weeks to do the research, theoretically, right? But like, functionally, you know, when we talk about, you know, I, I want to sort of urge us to not sort of try to parse that too na narrowly and be like, oh yeah, we just need to figure out the difference between the, the legal form and the illegal form, and then we'll do it from there. Because A, you know, targeting, we're not, you know, we're not very good at figuring out what legal or illegal sex work is, right? You know, there's a reason that the Supreme Court joke is like pornography, you know, the definition is I know it when I see it, it's because it's basically really hard to figure out. Also, very brief aside, very mo small moment of nerdery. The reason that's the, the thing that people say about pornography, that the Supreme Court justice said about pornography, is because in order to judge whether things were obscene, the Supreme Court used to sit in the basement of the, of the, the Supreme Court building and all nine justices would watch pornographic films to figure out whether they were obscene or not. Um, so like when they say, I know it when I see it, it's not just like a, oh, like haha, -ha, theoretical. It's like literally that like there are nine dudes down there trying to figure out if this is, constitutes obscene or porn. Um, and then when Sandra Day O'Connor joined the court, they were like, maybe this is a little awkward. Um, anyway, aside. So what was I talking about? Anyway, so right, the idea, you know, thinking about just not Again, in the, the way that we've kind of been trying to trouble some of the binaries I think folks go to for easy regulatory purposes or easy argumentation, right? Thinking about legal versus illegal sex work doesn't tend to be particularly effective. And we often end up including folks who are in marginalized, pop specifically folks who are in marginalized populations or precarious situations in what looks like a sex worker, independent of whether they're engaged in any form of sex work at all. Thank you, yeah. Very, very good uh, answers that we have. Okay, we're starting to have a bunch of questions um, coming in from the Slack. And so um, the first one up on the queue is, you know, how aggressive has FOSTA SESTA prosecution been? We talked about this a little bit. I know Kendra has written about this. Um, and kind of who's the motor behind the movement? Um, and I want to, you know, add to those questions, you know, there's a new act. Um, well, new, that's back again, not so new, uh, earn it, that's being passed around um, Congress that perhaps, you know, Kate or Kendra, do you want to explain to us a little bit about sort of the evolving uh, legislative policy situation in this area? You know, anything more you can say about, you know, what the response has been and kind of where that's coming from? I can take the FOSTA history if you want to take the earn it bit. I can try. Um, so how many successful prosecutions have there been under earn it? Well, the answer is there has been one federal criminal prosecution that we know of, uh, or sorry, under, oh my God, under FOSTA, Jesus, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, and sadly, um, but under FOSTA, it was a guy named, who ran a platform called City X Guide. Um, 
you know, uh, it, he was not prosecuted. He was prosecuted under Section 242.1a, which is the new federal criminal provision for operating a platform that promotes or facilitates uh, prostitution. Notably, he was not prosecuted either for promotion of sex trafficking nor for sex trafficking. They never, you know, even the criminal indictment for that um, against that platform never successful, never even alleged that, you know, or never alleged specifically with charges that there was like that they could tie it to particular instances of sex trafficking. The thing that has happened post FOSTA, other than the City X Guide prosecution, which is like the one example of a criminal prosecution that's happened. Um, a federal criminal prosecution that's happened is there have been a number of civil lawsuits of sort of varying quality. Let's go with that. Um, and I think, you know, the, some of these lawsuits have not, <laughs> have been brought even though the, the, the sort of conduct that they allege by online platforms has not um, really doesn't align with what FOSTA's literal text says should be uh, immune from Section 230. And that's resulted in sort of varying different uh, outcomes in the courts. Eric Goldman here at Santa Clara has done a really good job of kind of cataloging all of this. And one of the things we've seen is that, you know, in some cases, judges, including um, the Texas Supreme Court, have basically said, eh, screw what the, the law actually says. Like, we want to potentially hold Facebook liable um, for this, this particular instance of sex trafficking. What is notable and really important, and you'll, we'll, you'll get the sort of even better download this, this tomorrow during the 230 panel, but even in the absence of 230 immunity, 230 immunity is kind of just like, all right, like, you know, you, you can get the lawsuit thrown out super early, right? Um, even in the absence of 230 immunity, there is basically very little evidence that many of these online platforms knew anything about the alleged bad conduct or like the alleged trafficking that plaintiffs are talking about, right? That, and that's actually the legal standard, right? It can't just be that it happened on your platform, right? You know, that's not, that's not grounds for liability um, under uh, 50, Section 1595, so the federal sex trafficking, bit of the sex trafficking law that uh, allows for civil claims, claims by an individual against a uh, company, for example. Um, so it's quite probable that the actual outcome of all of this litigation will be that the platforms that are being sued will win. Right, because they, it is unlikely in many of these cases that they had the requisite amount of knowledge um, in, to sort of be held liable. Of course, you know, this is what the conversation about Section 230 is about, which is that it's going to take much longer for them to sort of reach that conclusion. Um, you know, we haven't really seen, I think, yeah, I think we haven't really seen um, very many examples, if any, of lawsuits where there's, you know, really the kind of uh, knowledge of sex trafficking that would, that one would think of um, and one sort of invoked by people who are looking for the passage of FOSTA, the sort of idea that these platforms were involved in like, you know, trafficking folks beyond sort of being a kind of neutral communications intermediary. Um, we haven't really seen successful or really any allegations, allegations of that. Yeah, and one thing I wanted to add on to the foster prosecutions is that, so City X Guide, when that went down, by the way, uh, Hacking Hustling, we work together, we, uh, I, I work with Hacking Hustling as well, and when we put up our uh, press release literally just talking about the fact that City X Guide had been pulled down, these were the charges, um, that was uh, blocked on Twitter that post specifically about City X Guide. So when we talk about not just the way that this is impacting um, folks at Trade Sex, organizing has taken a massive hit. And so when we're talking about like, you know, how do we talk to the to sex workers? Why aren't sex workers organizing? What we can't. And it's because all of the platforms that we keep using to try to organize, to try to build community, to try to combat the isolation and the lack of knowledge that leads people to take undue risk, to literally just distribute information about like, this is what harm reduction looks like when you're trading sex. This is how you negotiate for condoms with clients. This is how you screen clients to make sure that they are safe. Here's bad date lists where you can report negative encounters, where you can find out if the person that you're about to see has a history of rape or assault. That's being decimated too. 
And as an organizer, it has gotten harder and harder. I can't hashtag sex work. I can't hashtag sex worker. I can't hashtag sex workers work. I can't distribute information on platforms. We need listservs. And listservs, by the way, were covered by FOSTA, SESTA. Um, listservs, the way that we distribute basic information, the way that we connect to each other outside of physical space. And you can imagine how important that was during COVID. All of that is being targeted and decimated right alongside these platforms. And so when we're talking about uh, FOSTA and prosecutions, uh, City X Guide was not the first website to have been taken down. There was a number before, and FOSTA was just one of the charges. And the thing is that whether we're talking about my Red Book, which was 2015, whether we're talking about Rent Boy, which was you know, a couple years later, whether we're talking about Backpage, all of them had the same charges, and those were promotion of prostitution, local charges that were upgraded through the, the uh, Travel Act, which because of the internet, you can basically federalize state charges. Prostitu uh, promotion of prostitution, because they had some email evidence that people knew that they were trading sex on their site kind of broadly, and then money laundering charges around that, where they would seize all of the assets of everyone they were charging. And none of these have ever also gone to trial, except for now the Backpage case looks like it might. Every single one has pled out, and pled out mostly to money laundering charges. So if we're talking about who's actually being targeted, who's being charged, and then what they end up with, and what charges are sticking, we're not talking about anything remotely related to harm or victimization. We're generally talking about money laundering charges that are coming through promotion of prostitution. And so a, sexual, a, a, a successful FOSTA prosecution has not happened, but neither has a successful sex trafficking prosecution that is exclusive, exclusively related to fostering a website. There's some where there's been intersections, a couple where it was a trafficking charge, and they happen to host their own website where they would advertise, but that's not the same thing as what we're talking about here. Those are trafficking charges that just happen to involve a website. But there's actually not been a website that was not directly actively involved in trafficking of people where hosting that website has ever even been charged with something related to trafficking. Um, as far as the evolution of kind of what uh, is happening, and, and I apologize for not kind of contextualizing this in a lot of the other tech legislation um, because that's not my, my bailiwick and I generally don't understand what they're talking about. But as far as the- Neither does anybody else. Oh, thank you. Definitely not the people who are writing these things. Yeah. But, when we're talking about you know, trafficking and, and those pieces in CSAM, there has generally been a broadening of every time this happens. And Earn It now kind of broadens this idea of we're gonna, we're gonna expand your liability. We're gonna expand criminal and civil liability, and especially civil liability, because that's really important to these websites, and we're gonna do it in these different ways. And that was actually, that was really intentional. Um, before FOSTA-SESTA, there was um, something, uh, the Justice for Victims of Trafficking Act, which happened a couple years before. And what that did was actually look to expand the criminal federal definition of trafficking, really targeting Backpage. It was the same actors, it was the same people who, were pu who eventually ended up pushing FOSTA-SESTA, who were pushing that provision of the JVTA. They expanded the trafficking definition to include people that advertised victims of trafficking. Well, it was a criminal prosecution, which means it has to go through the Department of Justice, who then has to analyze the language and give guidance on what they mean by that. And the Department of Justice read this and said, we're gonna interpret this to basically say, if you are trafficking someone and you post an ad, that counts as an act of trafficking. This doesn't mean we're gonna go after Backpage, which is what they were trying to do. And so that passed, and the Department of Justice said, this is actually not trafficking, this is not what we're looking to prosecute criminally. And so what happened was SESTA was developed, and SESTA was developed as an expansion of civil liability that also expanded who could sue. So when Kendra is talking about the number of civil lawsuits proliferating, that was really intentional, and that was because they weren't getting the same criminal penalties because it is a pretty high standard for going after these websites. And so switching over to a civil liability and expanding who could sue civilly it was a very intentional act to encourage these civil lawsuits. And so what has happened since then is they had this provision around specifically commercial sex, and apparently that wasn't good enough. And so what Earn It is is actually a further expansion where they say we're not going to talk about any kind of specific charge. We're not going to talk about this over here. What we're going to do is have a panel which is vastly dominated by criminal uh, criminal justice folks, that is housed at the Department of Justice, that says this issue of harm, this issue of child abuse, 
is predominantly and almost exclusively an issue of criminal justice. It's not an issue of public health. It's not an issue of trauma. It's not an issue of the fact that we are desperately underfunding services to families. It's not an issue of identification and the fact that people who are experiencing harm don't actually come forward and report this because of a lot of different structural reasons. It's about websites and it's about prosecution of websites. And if you don't certify to whatever decisions that we make, then you lose your liability, or then you lose your liability protections. And so this issue is not one of criminal justice and who's being prosecuted. This is an issue of self-censorship for fear of civil liability, first and foremost. It is not an unintended consequence. It is the specific intention of this pattern. Thank you. Thanks, Kate, um, and thanks, Kendra. Um, so next up, I want to invite, you know, any questions from our in-person audience. I know I've been taking a bunch from the Slack, um, but if you are in person and you do have questions, I will know that you exist. Um, so please uh, go ahead and, and ask your question. I know we have one um, that's heading up uh, currently, you know, to be asked. 